of March. So as we move on to a new month, we move to new order of service. We pray divine service setting three. That's on page 184. So go ahead and mark that. One note about today. Uh, our gospel reading in our bulletin says John chapter 2. I'm going to be reading a different gospel lesson. And there's a big whole long story why we're going to do that, and I'm not going to tell you. Just so you know uh, that we're going to do that this morning. Uh, we sing our first hymn, 427. And 427. <laughs> Consumed me, and the 
reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. Let not the flood sweep over me, or the deep swallow me up, or the pit close its mouth over me.
and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This is the word of the Lord. Yeah. Second lesson for today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand as we hear the words of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel comes to us today from St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 11. casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the people marveled. But some of them said, He casts out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. While others to test him kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. But he knew knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid to waste, and a house divided falls. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul, and if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do you cast your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are saved. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest. And finding none, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. 
The last state of that person is worse than the first. As Jesus said these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. But Jesus said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. This is the gospel of the Lord. our Christian faith as we speak the Nicene Creed. Nicene Creed is on page 191. I believe in one God.
Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God the Father and from the Lord and the Savior Jesus. Amen. Uh, there are times Christ, I know I told you I wasn't going to tell you why. Uh, we had an alternative gospel reading, uh, but I will tell you. Uh, last night I did, I filled in at Trinity for their Saturday night service, and I got the readings, and I wrote a sermon uh, on those readings, uh, and then I got here this morning, and I looked at our bulletin, and the readings are over. Not that us and Trinity are on uh, different sets of readings, so... No big deal, you'll still get a sermon based on the scriptures. It just happens to be Luke chapter 11. And uh, in Luke chapter 11, this, uh, this is what happens. Jesus heals or casts out a demon of a man that is mute. The crowd tells him that he's from Satan. Uh, Jesus goes on and teaches them about Satan. And then, uh, and then after that, Jesus teaches a parable about the uh, a demon leaving a person and then coming and bringing back seven more. And it ends with a woman in the crowd shouting out to Jesus and saying, Blessed is your mom, Jesus. And Jesus turns around and says, No. Rather, blessed is everyone who hears the word of God and keeps it. So that's our reading this morning. Now, in our reading that we had moments ago, uh, the Lord Jesus quotes good old honest Abraham Lincoln. Did you catch that? A house divided against itself cannot stand. Now, uh, Abraham Lincoln... Uh, said this when he first gave a speech in the year of our Lord 1858 when he was the, the Republican nominee for the House of Representatives in Illinois an election that he lost by the way but his speech set the tone for all that he did in the following years, as he had to deal with slavery, as he had to deal with uh, seceding states, as he had to deal with ultimately the Civil War, which divided this country, and as the country fought to unify back to a united union. A house to divide it against itself cannot stand, Abe said. But we know that these are not original words of good old honest Abe. We heard them from the mouth of Jesus himself. Abe borrowed these words from Jesus to hammer home the age-old principle and truth that two warring, conflicting, Opposing parties cannot exist in the same room or someone's gone to the hospital. It didn't work for the slave versus the free states. And be careful. And it doesn't work with Satan's demons, his own armed forces. And against the age-old gilded sword of the Spirit, the very Word of God. Now, in the Gospel lesson, Jesus is goaded by the crowd of listeners into speaking on tactics that Satan is so very good at using. That is dividing people. So the crowd kind of forces Jesus' hand to have to teach them about Satan. Because they just accused 
terrible man from Satan. Now, Satan divides people. In fact, this is at the heart of what sin and Satan do to all of us. Bad behaviors <coughs> divide families and friends. Adultery, abuse, alcoholism divides husbands and wives. Conflicts over money or inheritance divide siblings and sometimes even churches. Laziness, busyness, or misplaced priorities divide people from hearing the word of God in church. Satan is a divider. And as he tempts us to sin, our sins then divide us from God. But think back to the context in which Jesus quotes on his age. Again, what has just happened? Well, this is verse 14. Verse 14 says this. Now, Jesus was casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the people marveled. Jesus was doing something incredible. Jesus was freeing someone from the clutches of a demon. <laughs> Jesus was unlocking the man's tongue so that he could speak once again, so that he wouldn't be tormented by the evil presence that had taken him captive. And that action, in that act of casting out the demon, and healing the man, Jesus was bringing down the kingdom of heaven down to earth among God's people on earth in our time and in our history. He says that in verse 20. He says this, But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Jesus brings about the kingdom of God. And all people who witnessed this event should have been amazed. But seemingly, with like everything that there is in life, in that crowd, there were a few party poopers. It just seems like in every situation we find them in our lives. So someone, one of the party poopers, yells out from the crowd. He says, he casts out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. Someone, again, stupidly cried out, and, by the way, no one likes that guy in their crowd. Others wanted only to see Jesus entertain them. Like Jesus is some circus monkey doing a song and dance. And so they ask him to do more miraculous things. Here, I'll read that from our lesson. While, this is verse 16. While others to test him kept seeking from him a sign of heaven. Because casting out a demon... And healing a man that was mute was not enough for them. You see, these people, they missed the whole point of who Jesus is and what he is about. In fact, Satan uses people and comments much like this to continue to divide people, at least there in that crowd, to believers in Jesus and to an unruly mob who will soon shout, crucify him. Jesus hears their charges against them, against him. Jesus sees the folly in their words and in their actions 
and in their desires to only be entertained because Jesus knows what's in their heart. Jesus takes their accusation that he is from Satan and he uses this as an opportunity to teach them about Satan. And as he's teaching them about Satan, he also is teaching them about the kingdom of God. So he begins his teaching again with that famous Honest Abe quote. He says, a house divided against itself cannot stand. It is preposterous to think that Jesus casts out demons using power that comes from the prince of demons. Jesus tells us that Satan is really unlikely to be responsible for the work that he had just done <coughs> since that would imply a serious weakness in Satan's power. Secondly, the Jewish people in that crowd, which most of the crowd was probably Jewish people, the Jewish people in that crowd to ascribe Jesus' exorcism to Satan for them to do that is to mean that all exorcisms done by them because they also have been doing exorcisms done by them and their priests then by way of logic then their exorcisms were done by Satan as well. Jesus says to them, and if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast out demons? So either they have to say, well, it's from Satan, or if they say it's from God, then they have to admit that Jesus was doing the work of the finger of God among his people. And then we get to verse 20, and Jesus gets to his main point. The casting out of demons is a sign of the kingdom of God. We know this because Jesus has just debunked that the casting out of demons comes from Satan. We know this because the release of Satan's victim implies that the demon's master, again that is the devil, the demon's master also is defeated. He has no real power over the one who stands there in front of him. And so Jesus warns them in verse 23. He says, whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. You see, those who want to be divided from Jesus, from his work of the kingdom of God, divided from his teaching and his disciples, those who want to be divided from him, are then under the control of Beelzebub themselves. Which leads Jesus to tell this really odd little parable about the demon leaving a person and then coming back with seven of his friends, seven freeloaders. Now, you would think that it would be a good thing for a demon to leave someone, and that that someone would go on to live their life and, and, and do things they like to do and live happily ever after. But then Jesus tells this whole parable. He says this, when the unclean spirit is going out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and finding none. It says to himself, self, I'm going to return to the house from 
where I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. Now this would, this little parable would not make sense if a foolish woman in the crowd would not have yelled out praises to Jesus' mother. Because it leads Jesus to proclaim that the word of the Lord is to be heard and kept by all people, and that is the answer to this parable he tells. Because you see, the whole point of that little parable about the one demon bringing in seven, it's about the folly of exercising demons without replacing them by something good. It is a warning to those who attempt exorcisms Trying to do them without proclaiming the message of the kingdom of God. See, the message of the kingdom of God should have replaced where that spirit had come from and so left no room for others to return. Uh, so the, after the exorcism, the proclaiming of the message of the kingdom of God is a must. Without the unsheathing, the guilt and sword of the Spirit, the very Word of God leaves a person open to receive all sorts of things. And so when Jesus responds, his response to the woman praising Mary, Blessed is the womb that bore you, blessed are the breasts at which you nurse. Jesus takes that and turns it around and says, no. It's about the word of the Lord. In fact, this is what he says. This also happens to be my confirmation verse. Luke eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus says, no, no, lady. Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Because it is the word of the Lord that defeats Satan. In fact, as Jesus cast out that demon from that mute person, Jesus is the word of the Lord made flesh dwelling among us, bringing about the kingdom of God. As he slays through Satan and all of our foes. But because, you see, Satan is going to do anything he can to divide you from your spouse, to divide you from your family, your kids, your siblings. Satan wants to divide you from your good Christian friends and even from the church. Satan will remind you of all of your sins, accusing you of all of your dirty laundry that you keep hidden way back in the recesses of your mind. Satan would like you to think that because of those sins, you're eternally divided from God. But he is wrong. Satan lies. And Jesus proves it because Satan is defeated. His head is crushed because the Son of God has brought down the kingdom of heaven to earth eternally as he died on Calvary's mountain to pay for the sins of the whole world, sins that threaten to divide us from God. And as Jesus rose from the dead, 
after proclaiming his victory in the depths of hell. Did you realize that? We say in our creed, I believe that Jesus descended into hell. No, he didn't. He went down there and he rubbed it in the face of every demon he could get his hands on that he won. He ensured that nothing will ever get between us and God's love ever again. In fact, St. Paul puts it this way. He says in Romans chapter 8, Well, who shall separate me from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or sword? And then Paul answers his own question. He says, no. <clears throat> In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Paul says, for I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation. And you know what? That includes Satan. Luther has a famous quote. He says, Satan is God's Satan. It's kind of weird this thing to say, but God actually created Satan. There's a big backstory on that. That's not for today. But God created Satan. God has power over Satan. So as a created thing, Paul says, nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because Jesus is the Word made flesh who dwelt among us. And then he reminds us, blessed are you who hear the word of God and keep it. Amen. Now may the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding guide our hearts and minds in the one true faith, even into life everlasting. Amen. Now in the response to preaching of God's word, we sing the, the words of Psalm 51, created me a clean heart of God. That begins on the bottom of page 192. Please stand as we say. <laughs>
uh, continue with our prayers, I'll conclude each petition by saying, Lord, in your mercy, congregation responds by saying, hear our prayer. Please stand as we pray. <coughs> Merciful God, you do not change and are always ready to hear our prayer. May our eyes be ever fixed on you, that we would always be ready to receive your forgiveness and help in time of need. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Almighty God, no kingdom divided against itself can stand, and a house divided must fall. Graciously preserve our nation with its government, frustrate the work of Satan and the seeds of destruction he would sow in every place where he is not stayed by, by were he not stayed by your gracious hand. Unite our leaders and our people for the common good, while leading us to hope in that eternal kingdom which is not of this world. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Holy Father, you have given us your own spirit in our baptism into Christ. Defend us from all spiritually attacks. Guard us in body and soul. Help those afflicted by any adversity, especially those we name, uh, that we name now among us, for Arthur, Tom, Gail, Marilyn, Ethelie, Marvin, Pat, Gabe, Jennifer, Russell, Jamie, Russ, and Loretta. And all those we now name silently upon our hearts, according to their need. Lead them to renewed strength and peace, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O Lord, grant unity to your church in her doctrine and life. Bless our communion this day, that from Christ's true body and blood, our faith may be strengthened, and our love for one another increased. Accept our sacrifice of thanksgiving and the tithes and offerings we bring in response to your goodness. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to take up our flesh, that he might overcome the devil and defend us poor sinners against the adversary. We thank you for your merciful aid and implore you to attend us with your grace in every temptation. Preserve us from carnal security, and by your Spirit, keep us in your word and fear that we may be delivered from the enemy and obtain eternal salvation. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue with the service of the sacrament as it begins on page 194. The Lord be with you. to celebrate the Paschal Feast in sincerity and truth. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
Our Father, who art in heaven, same night when he was betrayed to the bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after supper, he also took the cup, and after he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, Drink of it, all of you, this cup is my blood of the New Testament which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always.
continues on page 199. Page 199, as we sing the song of Simeon, please stand as we sing.
last tune, 435 and 435. Mm -hmm. 